Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, by Robert B. Cialdini Did you catch yourself buying something you didn't actually need? Just because the sales clerk persuaded you to? Or maybe you donated to an uncertain cause just because someone approached you on the street? If so, you've likely fallen prey to a compliance professional. Someone who knows exactly what buttons to push, and which strings to pull, to make you comply with their requests. Robert Cialdini asked the same questions and spent his entire career trying to find the answers to the question of why people comply with others' requests. In his book, he explained six fundamental principles of manipulation and the most relevant persuasion techniques that compliance professionals employ. Our brain loves shortcuts, and they can be used to manipulate us. This is due to simple necessity. The world is a complex place, where it's impossible for us to reflect upon the details of every decision we make. Thus, we use quick shortcuts, and most of the time, they serve us well. One example of such a shortcut is, that we're much more willing to do people a favor, if they provide us with a reason. Any reason. In an experiment to study this phenomenon, a researcher asked people queuing up to use a copy machine, whether she could skip the line. She found that if she gave a reason, may I skip the line? Because I'm in a rush? 94% of people complied with her request. If she gave no reason, only 60% complied. But fascinatingly, if she gave a nonsensical reason, may I skip the line? Because I need to make copies, 93%. Still complied. Apparently, people have a mental shortcut that deems any reason at all sufficient to grant a favor. More worryingly, so-called compliance professionals like advertisers, Salesmen and con artists can fool us into using our shortcuts against our own interests. They usually do this to get us to comply with their demands, for example, to buy a product. The first psychological principle of persuasion. The rule of reciprocation. We feel obliged to return favors. Has anyone ever given you something on the street? like a flower, or a free sample of something? Do waiters at restaurants occasionally bring complimentary sweets along with your bill? As innocent as these gestures may seem, they are actually relatively simple tricks to influence your behavior. This rule forms the foundation of all societies, for it allowed our ancestors to share resources, safe in the knowledge that they would be reciprocated later. And if someone does us a favor and we do not return it, we feel a psychological burden. This is partially because, as a society, we are disdainful of those who do not reciprocate favors. We label them as moochers, or ungrateful, and we too don't want to be labeled as such ourselves. In a study published in the Journal of Applied Social Psychology, researchers tested the effects that mints had, against a control group with no mints given. The first group studied had servers giving mints along with a check, making no mention of the mints themselves. This increased tips by around 3% against the control group. The second group had servers bring out two mints by hand, and they mentioned them to the table. Would anyone like some mints before they leave? Tips increased by 14% against the control group. The last group had servers bring out the check first along with a few mints. A short time afterward, the server came back with another set of mints, and let customers know that they had brought out more mints, in case they wanted another. This last test was where servers saw a 21% increase in tips versus the control group. This shows that when people receive something, even though it is only a mint, they felt the need to reciprocate. The more the gift is, the more they will reciprocate. The better the way you give, the more they will reciprocate. In 1976, Philip Kuntz demonstrated the automatic nature of reciprocity in an experiment using Christmas cards. In this experiment, Kuntz sent out holiday cards with pictures of his family, and a brief note to a group of complete strangers. While he expected some reaction, holiday cards came pouring back to him from people who had never met, 
nor heard of him, and who expressed no desire to get to know him any better. The majority of these individuals who responded, never inquired into Kuntz's identity, they were merely responding to his initial gesture with a reciprocal action. In 1985, Ethiopia was probably one of the worst-off countries in the world, ravaged by poverty, starvation and disease. And yet, in that year, the country's Red Cross sent $5,000 to eight earthquake victims in Mexico City. Why would this desperately impoverished country send money to another faraway land? Simple. In 1935, when Italy had invaded Ethiopia, Mexico had sent aid to the country, and this was an opportunity to return the favor. In the 1970s, the Krishna organization in the United States also used this tactic to great effect. They gifted flowers to passersby on the street, and though generally annoyed, people often made donations to the organization to satisfy their need to reciprocate the gift of the flower. Now, do you see the power of reciprocity? If you are in sales or marketing, you might want to use this to your advantage. But if you are on the receiving side, you might start by getting into the habit of asking yourself if the favors you receive are really genuine, or if they could be attempts to manipulate you. Think about whether you actually want to donate your money to that non-profit organization, or if you only feel obliged because they handed you a gift on the street.